the only thing I would mention here is if you can see here, I've also, I've also uh, started a research center at the University of Melbourne uh, on digital ethics. Um, uh, not that I'm such a, um, not, that I know some, uh, not that I'm such a great researcher in digital ethics, but uh, this is a university wide um, center and the, I'm one of the directors, the other one is from law, but we also have uh, we're across four faculties, arts and science. Uh, art, science, law, and, and engineering, which is where I am here. And uh, it's, it's this cross-disciplinary thing that I actually wanted to talk about today. So it's a good way to, to segue in to this talk. So um, thanks for the invite. And I'm, I'm really delighted uh, to be here. And I'm glad to see this workshop happening um, at conferences like KR because of the importance of uh, sort of taking what I'd say is less scrutable representations and making them more, more scrutable using logic approaches. Uh, and, and sort of like I, I run the XAI workshop at Ichikai and like um, uh, XLocker here today, um, it's, it's by far the biggest workshop at Ichikai, which is exciting to see. So um, it's a really great area to be in right now and a lot of excitement and a lot of, a lot of work coming out. And so the, the talk uh, that I want to talk about, this is a title from a paper that I wrote in 2017, I think. That I wrote in a few days actually. Um, it's called uh, Explainable AI Beware of the Inmates Running the Asylum um, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Social Sciences. So the, the bottom line is a, it, just a bit of a joke from a Peter Sellers film if you haven't seen it. Um, and uh, and the, the top line I'm going to talk to you about where that line came from which is probably uh, a little bit less familiar to you. Uh, but basically the whole talk is going to be a bit about cross-disciplinary research in explainable AI and why I think it's, it's important and why people should um, love the social sciences in this area. So, uh, we'll go to the next slide. So, uh, I'm going to tell, the overview I'm going to talk about what inmates, what I mean by inmates, uh, and then a little bit about the scope of, of explainable AI and how we can, uh, given that what I think should be the scope of AI, what I think, the way I approach it, how we can infuse social science research a little bit better. Uh, and then I'm going to give a, I guess, kind of case study of um, some stuff we've been doing at University of Melbourne. Most of this is from just one PhD project um, on model free reinforcement learning, explaining sort of agency when, when we're using model free reinforcement learning. And that's just, I just picked that one because it's a nice challenging uh, exercise to talk about that links a bit to this workshop. And then I'll, I'll conclude. Um, so the inmates, what's, what's inmates about? So the inmates running the asylum is this book here from uh, Alan Cooper that was uh, written in 2004 called The Inmates Running the Asylum, uh, Why High-Tech Products Drive Us Crazy and How to Restore the Sanity. And in that book, Cooper kind of asked the question, um, why, is, why, are so many, why is so much software just so terrible to use? Um, we have these really highly skilled people who are smart and, and really know what they're doing, but they just build these software systems that are just hopeless and, and, and they drive us crazy. And he kind of had this view that a lot of it was because there's this, you know, part of, of software, which is the interaction between the user and the piece of software. And that's a kind of difficult thing to design that interaction, that interaction design. And really what we're doing is we're leaving that up to software engineers um, a lot. And I'm, I'm a software engineer by training. And I can tell you now, I mean, I think more contemporary software engineering degrees are, are better than this. But when I did it, I, I learned very little about HCI, a little bit, maybe one subject. Um, and his kind of theory was um, we have to get away from that idea of software engineers designing software, being the only designers of software, because they effectively just design systems for themselves. And it's kind of like the inmates are running the asylum, right? If you give the inmates the keys to the asylum, it's a totally different place to if you don't. Um, and so his kind of, um, I guess his whole thesis in that was, well, we, we want to have a, a new role called an interaction designer. And it can be played by a software engineer, but they have to understand the different people that play a part that use a system and all the different stakeholders here. And, uh, and if you want to, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good book, actually. It's a great book, actually. And it's quite popular in HCI research. And in fact, if you're familiar with the concept of personas, uh, it actually that book was the thing that introduced them. And um, so the reason I find it interesting is because I kind of, in 2017, I had it, this, this kind of idea that this was the way explainable AI was, was going. Effectively, what was happening was, uh, people who are experts in their particular models. So, so I'm an expert in whatever, let's say they're an expert in um, you know, cl classification using uh, Bayesian deep learning. Um, they were sitting down and going, well, I'll write an explainer for my system. And I guess the paper kind of argued that if you're, if you're an expert on a particular technique, you're probably the worst person in the world to explain that to somebody who's not an expert 
So let's say an end user or a regulator, uh, because you understand that way better than them. And you're going to use the type of terminology that makes sense to you. And you're going to be worried about the inferences that make that you care about and not the things that other people care about. Uh, and, in the, and I sort of went and had a look at, you know, well, how many papers in the XI workshop the year before were sort of looking outside of computer science for inspiration uh, and how many were doing user studies. And the, the numbers were low. Practically nobody was looking at actually what do people want when they want an explanation? We're all quite inward focused and very, people, very few people were doing studies. They were coming out with explanations and not really actually looking at, do these help? Uh, and I sort of was trying to turn the community around a little bit. Um, so this is kind of uh, where, where I positioned the, the paper here is that this, this is where I think explainable AI sits, right? We've got this field called human AI interaction, which is where I, I, I was working, I am working at the time. And it's really this intersection between uh, AI, of course, cognitive science and, and HCI, human computer interaction. Uh, and I, I sort of felt like explainable AI sits in there, but I wasn't seeing much. People in that community weren't that interested at the time. People in HCI weren't that interested. It was really the only people in machine learning who were taking an interest in explainable AI. And I saw this as possibly a worry and we need to get these other groups uh, involved. And I'm kind of pleased to say, I mean, I, I've, I'll talk a bit about some of the work I did later. We're starting to see a lot more of this come in, even some cognitive and social scientists working in the area and heaps in, in human computer interaction. They both pale in significance to the people working in AI, but that's, that's, to, that's, that's uh, always going to be the case. But even in HCI conferences now, we're seeing workshops like this come up around explainable AI. And I really think it fits in there. And this is what I'm, I'm trying to encourage you today to, to think about yourself as here rather than um, here, even if, you don't, if, you, if you're not from cognitive science or HCI. And so um, a point I wanted to sort of make today is, um, I think there's a slide missing here, but um, when we talk about explanation, uh, it's, really, it's really a triple problem. We talk about three things and I want to talk about explanation because it's, I guess it's the primary mode that we come up with explainability in, 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 in AI uh, systems. Uh, and so, so this explanation in, uh, in sort of human human terms is we use it for three things. First of it's a cognitive process, right? So the sort of abduction that we do in our brain to come up with hypotheses and you know, look for evidence and select the, let's say the best hypothesis for, a, for an event we're trying to explain. But we also mean it to, we also say it to mean it like a product, right? We, we, have, we have an explanation that is the explanation. We talk about it as a noun and as a sort of product or a set of statements. Uh, but it's also a social process when you talk about giving an explanation, it's like this back and forth process between two people uh, and it iterates over. We don't just go, bloop, there's an explanation. It's, it's like you give part and you, and you sort of come to some shared agreement on what, what, the, what you're trying to explain uh, in a pair or a group here. And I think we, uh, we sort of, th there was a lot of work in AI focusing on this first one around abductive reasoning that's really great. Um, but probably when we're trying to explain a system making a decision, we don't need that so much. We've, we've done that part. Uh, but a lot of research was focused around explanation as a product. Here's the explanation here. And I, I really would like to focus more on this step here and sort of trying to do that. It's a pretty hard step. Uh, and we're sort of looking at some processes in that there. And I'll talk about, you know, a small step towards that that we've been doing. Um, and so explanation really though, all these three things have in common. It's about answering a why question. So the cognitive process, you ask yourself why and you try and explain something. Um, the product is the answer to the, the question and the social explanation is, is transmitting that product. And it's all around this idea of a why question. And really this is answering a why question is really philosophy and cognitive psychology and cognitive science and social psychology have been talking about these for a long time, like thousands of years in philosophy. And in the last 50 years, uh, psychologists and cognitive scientists have been starting to look at this question. What does it mean to answer a why question? And so to talk about this, I mean, let's talk a little bit about infusing the social sciences as kind of, uh, if we're the sort of inmates here, uh, I think most of us here are going to claim to we're probably the inmates, we're the computer scientists. Let's think a little bit about uh, how we might infusing the scientists. So this, uh, this is an example from a study by um, Tanya Lombroso, who's a cognitive scientist. Uh, and she's very well known for her work on explanation in cognitive scientists. And it's about a, a GP, a patient comes to the GP, and they've recently gained a bit of weight. They've been suffering from fatigue and they've had nausea. And the GP looks at a whole lot of um, stuff, asks a lot of questions and says, well, this is the four most likely things I can think that are, that are causing these symptoms. Um, 
patients recently had an injury, so they stopped they stopped exercising um, there. So uh, sorry, the patients recently had injury, so probably about eighty percent chance they've stopped exercising uh, enough in the in the last few months. Um, someone in their families had mono, so there's a fifty percent chance they might have got that. Um, that. There's a stomach virus also going around, so there's a fifty percent chance they had that. Uh, but also they've been trying to get pregnant and they haven't had a test yet, but they think the, the, the GP, she sort of assigns a 15% chance um, to pregnancy. And you can see here, you stop exercising. That's the sort of, that's, that's one way that you can gain weight or mono is one way you can get fatigue or stomach virus is one way you can get nausea and pregnancy. Well, that, that will explain all three of those symptoms. Uh, in the experiment, what Lavoso got people to do is say, okay, what's the best explanation for this patient, these three things that the GP should come up with? So the GP uh, looks at all these three things and she says to herself, well, is the best, the best explanation um, that the patient has stopped exercising and has mono and has stomach virus, or is it that the patient's pregnant, patient's presumably a female, if this is the case? And so I want you to think about that for a second. What do you think is the best explanation out of those two, A or B, for all these symptoms? Ignoring the fact there can be other things that can cause these as well. This is the four most likely ones. Uh, and of course, the answer is there's, there's probably no answer because we don't know what best, we haven't defined what best means. I've even put it in quotes. But people were asked to give what the best answer was. Now, if you're, if you're like me, if you're a computer scientist and you're, or you're you know, a statistician or even an engineer, you probably would go, well, assuming these three events are independent, uh, 80 times 50 times 50 is 20%. So that's, that's most likely, therefore that's the best explanation. But in the experiments that Lombroso ran, the pregnant one was overwhelmingly given as the best explanation. And the hypothesis that she was testing here was that people prefer short, simple explanations that explain multiple phenomena rather than multiple explanations that explain multiple phenomena. That sort of feels more right. And probably even yourself, if you, even if you did say, yes, 80 times 50 times 50 is 20, that's more likely. Probably you still felt like, oh, pregnancy though, that sort of feels like a better explanation here. And what the study goes on to sort of vary these probabilities and show uh, actually it, it requires this, the, the, the difference between these two to be sort of roughly double before people will, you'll start seeing more people saying, no, no, the, the former is a, a better explanation. Now there's no answer to this and it really depends on the context of what the explanation is trying to do. But it does feel to me like this is the kind of thing you should know if you're writing an explainability system that if you're trying to convince someone that, look, you really need to go home and rest and drink water. Um, and you're trying to, you're doing some diagnosis and you just want them to go home and rest and drink water. What are you going to tell them? The, this, the, the explanation that's most likely or the explanation that's going to get them to follow your advice. And it, it, and I can't say there's an answer to that, but we should know about these things before we do it. And I really think you should be infusing these types of, we should be infusing these types of studies into our, into our explainability. Not in every study, of course, every explainability project, but some. And so that's what the social science is good at. And there's, there's heaps of literature around this that I'll point you to in, in a little bit. But for that, I just want to talk about sort of infusing human-centered studies as well. So when we talk about explainability, we, we see a lot of, I'm running a special issue now, and we see a lot of papers saying, well, we've come up with a, a better explanation method. Uh, and, and what they never test is, is that actually a better explanation method? Do, do people find it more useful or more intuitive or they're more convinced by it or their trust goes up? We don't test this very much. And so I'm going to give you an example of, uh, I think, a whole body of work that happened that probably never would have happened if people had taken human-centered studies to explain ability a little bit better. And this is an example from a researcher called Bean Kim at Google Brain, uh, the talk she gave at Google AI, uh, of a saliency map. So if you're unfamiliar with saliency maps, they, they basically look like this. On the left, we have an image, uh, and these are explainability techniques that say, highlight the important regions of an image for my image classifier or, or whatever your task is here. But this is an image classifier. And this is an image of an, of an ATM, automated teller machine here. That's the, the classifier has said this is an ATM. And this is a saliency map used to drive by a tool called SmoothGrad. And for a long time, for a number of, there's a body of work going for a number of years where people were generating, uh, I guess they would say better and better saliency maps for images. 
Uh, but Ben Kim and some researchers went and did a study and, and looked at things. And it came out, I think, if, if I understood correctly, it came from this image. Uh, the researchers looking at this and saying, okay, here's the pixels that look interesting. Yes, I can, I can see the, the ATM here and I can see the man here. That's convincing. That's, yes, that's, that's, I, can, I can explain this to myself now. But what they sort of figured out was actually people, the researchers were just seeing what they wanted to see in it, right? They knew it was an ATM and they knew people mattered, used ATMs. So they were seeing this thing and going, yes, that's convincing an explanation. And Bean Kim's group said, they, they looked at the sort of the more numeric version of a sanity map and said, actually this, this smooth grad says, uh, sorry, this, the, the tool they were using says that this wheel is the most important thing. And this, this wheel is on like a trolley next door. That's got nothing to do with ATMs. What's this about? And so what they did was took uh, a neural network, actually uh, several neural networks that classified images and they just randomly jumbled the parameters so that it was total nonsense. It didn't do anything. And then they went and ran all the explainer, the, these, these um, saliency map tools over it and found they still gave convincing looking explanations like this. Um, and their, their findings ended up being effectively that most of these tools were completely so these explainability tools were generating saliency maps that were completely independent of either the model or the training data and therefore were probably completely meaningless. Uh, and what they were mostly doing was just doing edge detection, as you can see here. But people saw into it what they did. And it's my, my hypothesis had been that if they had done proper user studies, so for example, a very simple user study would have been to have said, here's a saliency map, uh, what is it predicting? Um, here and it would have been very hard to say that was predicting an ATM that, and that's a very simple user study and had they been doing user studies it would have actually saved sort of two or three years of research that people were doing on this um, these these types of tools to show that they, they were not very useful at all okay so this is very easy to say infusing the social sciences but um, there's really a lot of literature around on explanation in the social sciences goes back thousands of years <laughs> Aristotle is one of the first people to talk about it. So how as researchers can we go about um, getting into all this literature? And so uh, luckily there's a handy paper written by me uh, called, called Explanation and Artificial Intelligence Insights from the Social Sciences. So this was an article uh, I wrote in 2017 um, when I was on sabbatical at University of Toulouse. Here and I, I went into the sabbatical. I had six months, and I said I'm going to spend the first three or four weeks reading the li the literature on explanation in uh, in cognitive science and social science and philosophy because I'd I'd found some of it like, in the in the year before that. Uh, but it took me three months till I ended up with probably I looked at probably over 300 papers. I'd read 250, and this summarizes about 170 of them or something. Yeah, and this is just an overview of the philosophy cognitive science, social psychology around explanation. And it really just is a summary of, this is how humans explain things to each other. And the argument I, I make in this is that it's, you know, if we want to have good explainable systems, then probably looking at the way that humans explain things to each other is a pretty good start. Because it's much easier for me to take my system and give explanations that look natural and intuitive than it is to sort of expect all my user base to to adopt, you know, to sort of start to learn how to use my explainers. And that, that this is really just kind of was a, a service for the, the AI community that's, um, you know, got, got some HDI uh, researchers interested as well. Yeah, and it's, it's been, uh, I think it's been pretty impactful. People are reading it. Uh, I think people like it. I think people are taking the messages on board. So I'm going to spend the first, the next sort of 20 minutes or next 10 minutes talking about three big lessons I learned in all of this reading that I hope you'd take some um, insight from. Um, so the first one is that humans, human explanations are what we call contrastive. And so this is a quote from a guy called Dennis Hilton, who's at one of the University of Toulouse campuses. I met a few times when I was there. Um, and this quote says the the key insights to recognize is that we don't explain events per se, but we explain why one puzzling event occurred but not some other counterfactual contrast case. And what this actually means is usually we, we want an explanation when something unusual happens, the, the puzzling event, and we say, oh, that's funny, um, event P happened and I expected Q to happen. Why did P happen rather than Q? And so this, why did P happen rather than Q is what we call a contrastive why question, right? Why did P happen rather than Q. And it's interesting, uh, when I was, uh, when I was at, when I was in, in France, I went to, um, 
Microsoft Research in Cambridge and I was talking to a machine learning researcher there who I just met and, and I said, oh, I'm you know, just sort of doing this stuff on explainable, explainability. And he said, oh, that's, that's a hard thing. Uh, I was with my daughter who's, who was three or four or something like that at the time. And we were walking to the grocery store and she asked me what, why we're walking to the grocery store. And I said to her, I, mean, I can't answer that. What do you mean? Why are we walking to the grocery store? Do you mean why are we walking instead of driving? Or do you mean why are we going to the grocery store instead of the supermarket? Or do you mean why is it us instead of mum that's going? And I immediately recognized that, yeah, we knew what the P was, but we didn't know what the Q was, right? What was the daughter expecting they should have done um, here? And uh, it turns out, you know, as humans, we're very good at just saying, oh, why this? And the, then the person you ask will infer the Q sometimes, this is called the foil, uh, they'll be able to infer it by the tone. Because usually as adults, at least, we would ask the question, why are we walking to the store? Okay, that gives you a hint that I in, emphasize we. Or why are we walking to the store? That gives you a hint that I probably expected to drive or, or bicycle or something like that <laughs> here. And so I kind of uh, went and did, again, some more philosophical research around this and came up, found this sort of, these really groundbreaking papers on contrastive explanation that's, uh, I've never, this has never been published. I actually submitted it to a journal and I got some reviews that wanted me to make changes I didn't, I didn't really want to make. So I have never been able to submit it again. But I want to talk a little bit about um, this. There's kind of uh, two questions when you ask in contrastive explanation. It's, uh, so you have your model here, which is some uh, you know, knowledge base you have or some model that makes some inferences. And you can ask, uh, why did P happen rather than Q? That's when, you, when I was asking for an answer, why did we infer P rather than Q? Or alternatively, you can ask, uh, well, I had this, this model M here and it gave me P, but also, this other model gave me Q and it, it could be actually that your, the, the other model is um, a, the same model, but you're asking, well, you, you said P now, but yesterday I had a very similar looking case and it was Q. Why did you say P for this one and Q? And the M, the M is actually, you know, part of the model is the, uh, the inputs to your algorithm. Or it could even be that, you know, in machine learning, you're updating your model constantly. It could even be, well, the, the previous model I had a week ago gave me one answer and the same inputs has given me a different answer later. So, so why is that? Uh, but I really want to talk about why does it actually matter? And it's, it's this thing called the difference condition, which was highlighted by, uh, uh, really it was highlighted quite early in explainability by David Lewis, but Peter Lipton came up with this idea. And this is an example of mine from the paper, right? So um, it's just, this is just a crappy little example identifying arthropods. So you can identify a spider, beetle, bee or fly based on these attributes like legs, number of eyes, etc. And so you ask, why is it a fly? I can say, well, because it's got six legs, a stinger, five eyes, compound wings and, and uh, compound eyes and two wings. Um, but if I ask, why is it a fly rather than a beetle? Well, I can give you an explanation of a fly and I can give you an explanation of a beetle together. But usually you'll see that's not what I would give if I was going to, if I, you asked me this question, right? I wouldn't say, why is it a fly rather than a beetle? I wouldn't say, well, because the beetle has six legs and a stinger and two eyes and compound wings and compound eyes and wings. And a fly has six legs, a stinger, two eyes, compound eyes and wings. I would say this, right? But it's a fly rather than a beetle uh, because a fly has five eyes and this thing has five eyes and, uh, a beetle has two and this doesn't, this clearly has five eyes. So it's not going to be a beetle. It's more likely to be a fly. And the idea here is of course, if you look at all the other attributes, they all agree. All right, they've both got six legs, a stinger, compound eyes and two wings. These are the two that's different. And this is the, the difference condition. And so this might seem, this is a sort of, you know, a trivial example, but if you think about, you know, kind of any contemporary modern AI model, no matter what it is, machine learning models have, you know, even symbolic machine learning models have you know, up to thousands of uh, uh, parameters in them. Uh, neural network models, tens of thousands, if not millions of different parameters. Um, Logic-based models have hundreds of concepts around. So when you have sort of a thousand of these things, you might think that, well, I only have to find the difference. Now this could be trouble. You could say this could be problematic because there could be still hundreds of differences. But usually it's not going to be. And this is what Lipton makes the case of. Um, it's pretty unlikely if I had a system that, say, analyzed lots of different uh, animals, uh, it's pretty unlikely I would say, why is this a fly rather than a giraffe? That's 
that's really unlikely because I was never going to expect a thing that you thought was a fly is a giraffe because they're so different. It's really only going to be these cases where there's some similarity, right? It's going to be a thing with wings and legs and it's going to be an arthropod or an insect or something like that that's going to cause confusion. And they're more likely to have lots of common features than, than other things. So this difference condition is a very powerful way to break down an explanation from, well, there's 10,000 attributes, but I can just give you the 10 that, that matter. So that's contrastive explanation. And the second lesson I think is interesting is that explanations are social. I talked about the social process. This is another quote also from Dennis Hilton. This is a great paper around uh, sort of a body of work he did that showed that, well, you know, when humans and humans are explained to each other, it's a conversation and it, it acts like it's like a conversation and it's, it's sort of, uh, it obeys the, the, the Gricean maxims of conversation. Uh, and the, the, the thing here is that explained is a three place predicate. Someone explains something to someone else and it's like a conversation. And I think this is interesting and I don't, it doesn't mean that every explanation you give has to be verbal in a conversation, but it's nonetheless, it's an, I think explainable AI can be an interaction between people, right? Dennis Hilton wasn't studying things like visualizations, which can be very powerful. And he, he makes his point um, when I spoke to him saying, yeah, but conversation is very limited to just giving a few explanations in a visualization. You can give a lot more. Um, so it, it's going to be slightly different, but nonetheless, it will be uh, an interaction. You give some visualization and, I question part of it and do all this. Uh, so we kind of, we studied this and this is a, uh, this paper here from uh, one of my students. I'm going to talk quite a bit about his work uh, that was at AMAS last year, a grounded interaction protocol for explainable AI. And so there's work from philosophy, especially Doug Walton, who's a, who was a um, really great researcher in argumentation. He looked at some sort of philosophical models of explanation dialogues. Um, here, but we, we took a much more grounded approach. So um, Prashan went and found about, I think it was 400 dialogue, ex explanation dialogues from a range of different sources from sort of online Q&A to transcripts of court proceedings. And he went and looked at all these things and looked at what are, did a sort of thematic analysis of what are the patterns that we see in explanations. And I'm not going to go through the whole model or how we did it, but I think it's interesting to see uh, it doesn't just follow the kind of explainer asks a question, explainer gets an answer and it ends. In fact, we never saw that. We always saw explainer gets, even the simplest explanations were ask a question, get an explanation. Um, and we, we, you can exit here, but we hardly ever saw that. We usually saw an affirmation process. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. That seems to be important. Maybe it's not so uh, important in, in digital systems, but I think it's going to be pretty important. But what I did find was interesting was this fact that, that we saw arguments all the time. So explainer asks, explainee asks a question, explainer gives an explanation, it's because of this. Explainer argues the, the assumptions behind that. Well, no, I don't actually believe that that's the case. So, you know, why did you do, why did you say this? Well, because so-and-so did this. Well, no, I don't think they did do that. They did something else. And then they go through and they tend to either res, sort of resolve the argument and they come back to the explanation um, or sometimes they exit the argument and, and the explanation fails altogether. Here. And it's kind of interesting. I think if you're interested in interactive explanation, this gives a, you know, somewhat of a high level model of how explanations uh, work and you can learn something. <laughs> uh, and the last lesson I learned with it, you know, explanations are, accept, uh, are selected. Uh, this is maybe kind of obvious um, here, but uh, this is a great quote from um, Hanson. Um, that, that there are as many causes of explanation uh, of X as there are explanations. So if you ask for a cause of death, Physician will say multiple hemorrhage. The barrister will say negligence on behalf of a driver. The, the carriage builder will say it's a defect in the lock. A civic planner will be because of the tall shrubbery. There's all these things that, that account to things. And, but usually if you say what caused the deaths, uh, you, you pick one or two little things that, are, that seem the most important. You can use a difference condition that I talked about earlier, but it turns out there's a whole range of patterns that people use that sort of are, are, are general across different um, things here about importance. And so, for example, one of them is if you have a sort of a, a, a temporal chain of events of, that unfolded, if you're trying to describe a scene, that the things that happen more recently are more likely to be selected as causes than the things that happened in the past. Um, but there are some exceptions to that. So things that happened in the past that were an explicit choice by a person, they sort of override uh, things that weren't choices that were more physical causes uh, and you will trace back further. And the, the paper I wrote describes quite a lot of these important ones. So that's the kind of three um, 
the three lessons I learned is the, the contrastive explanation thing, the, inter, the social interaction and, and the selected. And they all kind of interact, obviously. You can see you select one bit and then someone's not happy. So you, you iterate over and you give, you give additional things. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk then a little bit about how we've applied some of these things to agent-based uh, models. So we, we, we really looked at model-free reinforcement learning. So if you're unfamiliar with model-free reinforcement learning, it's a challenge compared to say model-based planning where I've also done some stuff uh, because th there is no model in model-based reinforcement learning. This is where you just interact with the environment and an agent learns how to act just based on negative and positive rewards from the environment. And it doesn't actually keep a model of the environment in, in model-free reinforcement learning. So when you say, I, I want an explanation for things, it's really hard to grab onto sim symbols that you can, you can give. Um, so the, the approach we took here was to model the environment, what's called, what we called an action, an action influence graph. And it's, if you're familiar with structural causal models, which uh, uh, sort of Judea Pearl and, and Joe Halpin's um, set of models, for, sort of logical models for explaining things, we, we extended them by adding influences, uh, so action influences to them. And so I'm not going to go over this whole example here, but this is an example from a uh, a game called Starcraft, which is a sort of, there's, a, there's some good model free reinforcement learning environments for it. Uh, and we basically have these nodes here and each one of these nodes is a variable. So W is the worker number here. And the idea of Starcraft is you build, you, um, you hire workers and you build depots and you build barracks and you find out where the enemy is and then you attack them. It's a um, yeah, sort of that, that kind of strategic military type game here. Uh, and so all of these are variables factored state variables here. And the, the lines between them, are, this would say that the action AS, which is uh, build a supply depot, um, has an influence from W to S. And what this really means is once you have enough workers, if you try to build the supply depot, then you'll get more supply depots. Uh, and we just provide this graph. So it's at the level of abstraction that you think is good for explanation. And we know what the, the state is and we know what the actions are and we just make assumptions around what these, where, where should these arrows be drawn here. Uh, and then you can actually then at, during your training, we actually, well, not during, tra during training, we stored a whole lot of the data that was being used during training. Uh, and what we actually did was then uh, you could verify whether these links were valid or not. So you could say, I think there's a link between here and here, but when I execute this action, uh, B never changes. So I think this link isn't here. Uh, but what we really learned was what the influence was between these variables here. So in this case, this is a better example here. A N takes uh, two the same action A M here, which is a train an offensive unit, which takes supply, the number of supply depots and the number of barracks. You need a certain number of supply depots and barracks in order to be able to train a defensive unit. And we learned what these relationships were. And we just learned them as linear, linear models using linear regression, but you could, you could use anything. You could use logical models or more advanced machine learning models. But we just we basically learned that, oh, if you execute this action AM and you have these values of these variables, this will update this AN variable here. And so this is an approximate model of the environment. So if model free reinforcement means there's no model of the environment, we learned an approximate model of the environment. And the idea behind this is it's not, a, it's mo to learn a model of environment in reinforcement learning is really challenging. And there's, there's a whole lot of research that goes and looks at it. We were just interested in learning enough of it to give explanations. That's it. Uh, and we don't learn all of the effective operations. We just learn these influences. Uh, and then we did, we, we basically came up with contrastive explanations for reinforcement learning. And I shall go back and sort of show you why, uh, how you do it, right? If you said, uh, why did you execute this action AS, whatever it is here? Uh, you can say, well, if I execute that, it would, um, in this particular state, it would lead to more of these things here. And you can follow your influence graph and say, and that gave me a reward of destroying units which was what I needed to do in order to, to win the game and also to destroy buildings, which is what I need to do to give the game. And so you could kind of link this action through, all the way through to its goal. Uh, and so this is an example from Starcraft. Um, I, I'm, not familiar, I'm not that familiar with the game. I don't play, play it that much, but um, this is uh, building a barrack. This is a new barrack. I'm building barracks. This is an explanation we get in a contrastive explanation. Um, why did you build barracks instead of attack? Well, I'm building barracks instead of attacking because my goal is to kill enemy units. That's that link to the end. 
and enemy buildings and the number of offensive units I have is not yet optimal. So it's kind of really just pointing to the goal and saying, look, I'm not at the point where I can do attacking yet. And there's, you could give a better explanation if you're a human player, but we don't have the information for it yet. Uh, and so we did a user study on these um, with 120 participants using StarCraft agents. And we had four models, sort of four independent variables, um, no explanation. It's always, it. we just showed videos of the behavior of how it was working so people could learn how StarCraft agent worked. Uh, we used what was at that time, the state of the art in explaining um, MVPs, which is the, the uh, it was a model-based one called state action relevant variable explanations. It's now, there's other, uh, other bench sites we would have used now, but this was a couple of years ago. Uh, and we gave two explanations from, uh, our thing was a sort of very detailed causal graph and a more abstract causal graph. And we measured three things. And the first one I'll talk about uh, briefly is called task prediction. And so task prediction, what we actually did was uh, we trained people up. We would show them some behavior and they could ask contrastive. They could ask, why'd you do this? Why didn't you do that? They could ask things to, to learn about the model. And we gave them, I think, six tasks like that where they were able to interact, sorry, six sort of training tasks. And then once they had done that, we stopped giving explanations and we gave them six more tasks where they just had to predict what would the agent do next in this situation? We'd show them a video and they'd have to predict the, the next action. And uh, not what do you, th you think is a good move, it's what do you think that agent is going to do? And the idea behind this is, if you understand enough about the, the, the underlying model, you're better at doing prediction in these things. And then we measured some sort of what are more subjective type things like explanation quality, uh, asking people on a scale of one to five, is it complete? Is there enough detail, satisfying and understandable? And whether they trusted the underlying model to be predictable, confident, safe, and reliable. Um, before I talk about the results, I want to talk a little bit about this evaluation and, and task prediction. Uh, and this, this paper here that probably came out last year, I think, Metrics for Explainable AI Challenges and Proposals. So uh, Robert, Shane, and Gary, I sort of, I've done a bit of collaboration with them. And they are the, the sort of cognitive science team in this big DARPA XAI project. There's about seven different teams and there's six doing explanation stuff and they're the sort of cognitive science team. And they wrote this brilliant paper um, looking around how to assess explainable AI specifically. Uh, and they're, they're, uh, Robert in particular is a, an expert on human machine interaction. And this is a really great paper. They talk about scales for rating explanations and how they talk about task prediction. This came out after I think that, that paper, how to do task prediction, how to do you know, sort of really detailed studies of people's mental models when they get explanations. Really great paper. If you're interested in doing any user studies at all in explainability, I would highly recommend this. Uh, but anyway, so we use their scales there. And this is, I mean, I'm going to give some high level results. So the task prediction here, which measured, you know, how much did you really understand the model? It's like a proxy of how much you understand the model. We saw that, yeah, that the sort of, if you, if you had uh, no explanations at all, you were just looking at behavior, you did okay. But um, if you had this previous sort of state explanation model, you did a little bit better. The dot here is average, um, a little bit better, but the two sort of uh, causal graph things that we used um, were you did better at task prediction. Uh, and we sort of got better subjective results. I'm not gonna go over these, but pretty much people found the explanations a bit more complete and satisfying, slightly better at, um, sort of there was enough detail and they understood them. And no, I, I would say these, these aren't huge results on trust. They would probably look more convincing in these graphs and what they really are around whether people found them trust, but they definitely did find it more predictable because they, they understood it a little bit better. Um, so that was the sort of first study we did on looking at this basic understanding and using things like causality, um, this sort of human centered approach to contrastive explanation. Uh, and then, we did a, a kind of a nice thing that uh, when people were giving their answers for task prediction, you'd say, well, what, what do you think the agent would do next? And they would say, and then we said, uh, why did you say that? Uh, and people would write in their answer. And now we had a corpus of explanations for you know, software agents effectively for agents. And so we used that corpus. Then we went back and looked at it and said, what do the explanations that we were giving, how do they compare to the explanations that people were giving? Uh, and we found there was some similarity, but we found one thing we were really missing. And it's called an opportunity chain. And we had, we had read about it. You can read about it in my survey paper. So as soon as we saw it, we recognized what it was. 
And people refer to these a lot. And an opportunity chain is something that looks like this, right? Uh, you, you ask someone, why did they do A? And they say, well, I did it. I did A because that enables me to do B. And then B causes, and then B enables me to do C or something like that, right? So in the, the reinforcement learning thing, it's, well, I did A because that enabled me to do B. And then if I did B, I would achieve my goal of destroying units or whatever it was here. Uh, and so we, we thought, okay, that's interesting. But again, we have no model of the environment in model free reinforcement learning. So how can we, how can we derive these things? And I'm not going to go into the detail about how we did it. I think that the lesson of analyzing the explanations is what I wanted to talk about. Uh, but you know, this is kind of a, an overview. Effectively, we had a compact representation of our policy as a decision tree. Decision tree is like an interpretable version of the, the underlying policy. We had different underlying policies um, trained using different reinforcement learning mechanisms. And we kind of link these two things with the action graph in order to get to, to come up with this po um, policy um, thing here. But the important thing we did that was quite different to the previous work was we, we actually learned, we, we learned this. So we, we learned a, a sequence to sequence uh, model using a recurrent neural network and said, well, quite often when we execute A, we see that we execute B later and we only ever execute B when we've executed A before. That's probably a hint that A enables this B thing here. So we're going to make that, we're going to get wrong, we get that wrong sometimes, but actually it turns out we get it right quite often. And then we sort of put it together here to come up with these more uh, convincing explanations. I'm not going to go to all the detail. But you can see the difference here between our earlier causal contrastive explanations. Uh, why did you um, not train? Uh, why did you not attack? Uh, because it's more identical. This is the original one. It's more desirable to do train marine to have more units because our goal is to have more destroyed units and more destroyed buildings. That looks kind of familiar. Uh, but the change here is in this, this italics because the allied unit number S is less than the optimal 18 and it's more desirable to do um, the enable train action as the goal is to have more destroyed um, units here. But the main difference is it's more desirable to do the train marine to enable us to do the attack action later. Uh, that was the, the sort of main difference we got and a few other little things we could piece together. Uh, and then we ran this same kind of model, same kind of thing here. We didn't run the, the state action explanation baseline now. We just ran our old one against our new one and the, the no explanation thing, we ran across three different, three different um, simulation environments here, um, an adversarial environment, a collaborative environment and a rescue environment. And this, we saw these kind of results here that this was the no explanation baseline here. This was our previous causal one and this was our new distal one. So results were quite a bit improved, uh, especially um, in this collaborative scenario here where they had to, the agent and the, the person had to work together a little bit. And it wasn't so much a task prediction in that one. It was the agent does one thing and then you have to do one thing. And so the agent was basically telling you, look, I'm doing this because it enables you to do this later. Um, so it, it worked quite well. And the lesson out of here is that just that we, yeah, we looked at this grounded data and thought that's what's missing for us. Okay, so I'll, I'll um, sort of um, tidy up now. So um, if, I just want to summarize what I'm talking about here. So if you're a sort of, if you're an inmate like me, you're a fellow inmate, um, I think it's important to realize that when we talk about explanation, the sort of how, how people generate and select and evaluate explanations is pretty well understood and already in the cognitive and social sciences and philosophy and the social interaction of ex explanation is also reasonably well understood um, there. And we can learn a lot from those social sciences. And um, val I think validation on human behavioral studies is, is critical at some point. That doesn't mean every paper needs it, but just at some point we need to say, our explanations look good to us, but do they look good to the people who they're intended for? Um, and, and so remember that Hoffman paper if you're interested in doing that. And if you're sort of a ward, if you're actually here, I don't think there would be too many people in a, in a KR conference, but if you're one of the, the wardens, someone who's outside of the explainable AI, then it you know, really, it'd be great if you jumped on board. And so I collaborate with uh, a cognitive scientist in, in University of Melbourne and two HCI, uh, really great HCI researchers who are in my, my school. And, or, and, and they're a great help in building studies and designing um, systems. And, and um, yeah, and if you're into inter interaction design, that's, it's a really great area to be right now. 
the funding element, don't need them. So the overview here is that, you know, I, I really think we should be treating explainability as a human age interaction problem. And the social sciences community perhaps already know more about what we should be doing than, than we do, but we know how to do it. So I think that that, that um, cross-disciplinary part's important. And this has been really useful in my lab for, you know, doing contrastive explanation and using things like causal mechanisms and opportunity chains uh, to improve our explanations. And I really hope this talk would encourage you, some of you to go to your other, you know, looking more cross-discipline research and, and looking at social science and incorporating it to your explainability too. Thank you.